infrastructure and facilities. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. Um, this was my first Disney Nature film, and uh, it was about two years of filming. Now, that doesn't happen two years, you know, <coughs> contiguously, but it is like two years through spurts. Uh, and definitely on this situation, we had teams, you know, each animal had its own team, so uh, it, there's simultaneous filming going on. Now, when you get to these places, uh, it's amazingly remote. Uh, particularly if you look at the snow leopard uh, uh, area, uh, there are no facilities whatsoever. And so people are literally trying to keep warm at night in sub-zero uh, degree temperature. Uh, it is an, a true adventure just filming these things. Yeah, uh, my desk job sounds pretty good right about now. <laughs> yes. So we also know you for your work on animated films, films like Tangled and Big Hero 6. So you're no stranger to these lengthy production schedules because like Disney nature films, animation takes years to produce. How else are those mediums similar and how are they different? It's interesting because in one way, there's a similarity between story because we're always looking for the greatest <coughs> stories for both those, both those genres. Uh, but with animation, you start with storyboards and you start creating a script and you come to the peak of your story. What happens with, it's almost exactly opposite with Disney Nature. You have these great cinematographers who are out in the field filming this phenomenal footage and keeping journals of the stories that they're witnessing. And so then we take that footage, we review all that footage and work backwards and create a story. So somewhere in the middle we meet and always the core is the story that we tell. Yeah. Uh, let's take some questions from the audience. Who has a question? For Roy, we have some microphones out in the house. We open right here. Okay, on this side. Thank you. By the way, it was amazing, wonderful. I cried like a baby. Great. It was, just, it, it was beautiful. Um, quick question: When is there a period of time when you send the cinematographers and photographers out in the field where they have to sort of just acclimate, not them in particular, but the animals do to get used to that? And do you sort of take this purist point of view where you are strictly observers and don't interfere it as much as possible with nature? That's a great, That's a question. great question. Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. Uh, from the purist standpoint, we do not. Um, we do not in any way try and impose uh, anything within the filming, nor do we try and uh, some alter in any way the relationship between the animals in the field. So if something happens, it happens, and we're filming it, and we, that's where we get our stories. Um, you know, the, the uh, filmmakers, these, these filmmakers, the cinematographers, <laughs> know their work so well, and they know their animal. In fact, Shane Moore, who was the cinematographer of the Snow Leopards, is probably the greatest cinematographer of big cats in the world. He's done cats all over the world. Uh, for him, this was, we, we talked about it, the holy grail of cats, because it, they're so elusive. And he went out in the field four times, and the first time he went out was three months and he didn't get a shot of a snow leopard till his final day. And because we were working in China, we had like chunks of visa time. So he had a three month visa. He had to leave the country. We were all trying to figure out in Burbank and in Bristol where the cinematography end of things is kind of centered, whether we should in fact continue. Was this a fool's errand? And Shane said, I've got it. I, I, I know now what we need to do. And he went in for the next three month period and got some of the most amazing footage. Started off probably 400 meters away, uh, got to the point where m most of his shooting was around 70 meters away. Uh, at one point was able to get into about 40 meters. He could get in, f when there were no cubs around, he could get in that close, if, if, particularly if the animal was feeding. Uh, but if there was the cubs around, he stayed way back because they didn't, they didn't want him there. So they're, they're very attuned to that. Great question, thank you. Got one on this side of the house. Thank you so much for being here. Um, during the credits, we saw some interaction between the monkeys and the cinematographers, and I was wondering if you could talk about sort of when that line was crossed and that interaction began. 
Well, it, it's interesting because depending on the type of animal, there, there, there is a line that can be crossed. Uh, the monkeys have absolutely no fear of humanity. <laughs> They are the most gregarious, they are the most uh, fascinating creatures, and they have absolutely no problem when someone comes into their environment relating to them. Uh, definitely the cats, that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to be very careful and you have to be very protective, protective when you're out there shooting. Uh, and particularly when you have to, you know, you have to be careful in terms of the, the mother cub relationship. Uh, and then the pandas are really interesting because that's where you don't want to cross a line. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, they're mo they're, you know, they are the most adorable creature on earth. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, a mother panda is about 800 pounds. And, um, you, you, you know, and you don't want them to get too habituated to the human. That you don't want them really feeling comfortable around humans. So the guys would actually don black and white suits that uh, made them look and actually smell like pandas so that they could get in close, but they never got so close that they could actually touch a, can a camera. Uh, a lot of times in the, in, the, in the end when you saw, there's a great shot where you see um, the wolves kind of come up to a camera. That's a camera that's been placed there. There's no human in, in activity that's being shot, that, that's being monitored from far off. Great question. On this side. I also noticed in the credits that they had an infield medic. Oh, yeah. Which interested me. And then I had a second, if you'll allow it. Um, I'm interested politically with what's happening with China now. How does that impact any of, or any other country, how does that impact a future Disney Me Too program? Um, first of all, uh, on any live action mm -hmm. set, mm -hmm. there is a medic. You know, so if it's a regular film, there's always a medic. And in these particular situations, you definitely want a medic because you, you know, you, it took eight days for the team to get to uh, the Qinghai Plateau where they filmed the um, snow leopard. So if you don't have any kind of medical care, something could happen and we wouldn't want that to happen. Uh, as the political situation, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I found from a filmmaker to filmmaker perspective, no difference at all in dealing with my Chinese brothers. Uh, we were so ensconced in telling the story, we were so ensconced in trying to get the message out to people about how important these animals are to their culture. So uh, it'll be interesting, because I, you know, there's a lot of ruffling going on in terms of the economic situation between the states and, and China right now. So we'll see how that uh, affects the box office. Hopefully it won't affect it at all because I think these stories are really important and the animals have nothing to do with politics. They have only to do with existence and, and you know making sure that these animals are there for generations to come. We have time for two more. Let's take one over here and then we'll throw back to this side. Pass the mic. Surprisingly efficient. Oh, okay. Well, um, I, I was impressed with that. Actually. Yeah, I was impressed. Thank you. A lot of collaboration. Really appreciate here. appreciate that. Um, you mentioned the camera that was placed, and 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 uh, how many of those cameras did you guys? How many camera locations did you have? How long, were you, obviously you were getting those time lapses of flowers. How, how many cameras were out there? Yeah. How long were they out there? And you mentioned the snow leopard, he had to come back only for that three months since. So how did that affect the storytelling? Of, was he only then there for three months? How, it went for so many seasons, like we covered so many seasons. How did you guys manage that? How long were you out there shooting? Yeah, I mean, you know, the technical aspect of him having to come back, you have to leave the country reapply, it takes about two weeks for you to get back in the country, so it's... But he didn't see a snow leopard for the first three months, so how long, how many months? You said he didn't see one for three months. Yeah, he didn't see so one for three months. he was only covering those 
those ones were only for three months then? No, but he went, he went, he went four times. Oh, four times. So okay. he got, he, he actually he got a full cycle. Okay, good. I was confused. And I'm like, well, how did that happen? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then how many cameras did like locations when you had placed without crew on them? You know, it depends on which animal. For instance, uh, we don't talk about the Chiru and the red crested crane, which I think are, the, the Chiru story for me is really kind of phenomenal. That's a very small crew out there, and they probably have three cameras on their on their shoot. Uh, the Qinghai Plateau, there's one major camera where they're getting the long distance stuff, but then there are some of those remote cameras that they brought in. So there was probably five or seven cameras at most out there. Uh, it's kind of amazing when they trek in, particularly when they were trekking in for the monkey stuff. Uh, the, you, well, you see, I think in the end, you see a line of people just carrying tons of equipment. Well, that, that equipment is also living equipment, so mm -hmm. for them to be able to, you know, stay there for the months that, they, that they're in, in the vicinity. So. so each crew had how many people, like the cameraman, and then how many were in each crew? Uh, initial setup, there would be probably 30 people that would go out, and then people would go away. So, because you want that, you, you need for the filmmaker an intimate environment to create that trust with the animal. If there's 30 people all hanging around there, it's, uh, the, the animals will, you'll never see them. Okay, cool, thank you. We have time for one more question. I'm gonna throw up to Chris in the upper level there. Hi, I just wanna thank you so much for being here and for allowing us to screen the film. Um, my question is twofold. Um, how do you identify the animals since you're shooting for such a long time? How do you how how do you ensure that the animals you're shooting are the same animals? And then how do you go about um, identifying those like um, relationships, especially like between the sort of enemies or whatever? Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's that's a great question actually because we don't go in with a script. So the animal stories and the animals that we choose basically evolve through that filming process. So uh, in this particular case, uh, you know, we had crews out for Chiru, we had crews out for Red Crested Crane. We found that those stories were very limited in terms of scope. Um, and it was Chuan, our uh, director, who really identified the fact that, well, yeah, the Red Crested Crane is so important to China as a spiritual metaphor. And the Chiru is so important as kind of the earthly embodiment of the cycle of life because they do this amazing migration each year. Uh, he, I think, brilliantly uh, encompassed the stories that really popped, which were, you know, the, the snow leopard, the, the panda, and the monkey. So it, it wasn't until we had footage that we knew what story we could tell. And it's by uh, amazing amounts of journaling. These guys that are out in the field, Schwann spent a lot of time on the field. I was very seldom uh, in the field. Um, it, you know, again, you wanna keep the shoot sites very small because you need to get that intimacy between the animal and the cinematographer. So it's really, once you get the film, you know what stories you can well, we are out of time. These were great questions. You all should be up here in, in my seat. This is great. One more time, round of applause, please, for Roy Conner. Thank you so much.